Easter, 1916. At noon, Dublin, Ireland explodes in gunfire as a motley band of Irish rebels takes on the world's biggest empire. They begin by hijacking a post office. Many of the people of Dublin during the Rising viewed it as the expression of a gang of crazy people. I don't think there was any consensus view among the revolutionaries themselves as to what they hoped to achieve. Outnumbered and outarmed, the rebels would be crushed by British forces within days. And what was intended to be the opening act of the Irish Revolution became a humiliating failure. But history would tell a different story. The rebels would be honored as heroes. Their actions would inspire thousands to join the revolutionary cause and set Ireland on a rocky road to independence. On May 1st, 1916, a poet named Patrick Pierce wrote a letter to his mother from his cell in a Dublin jail. We are ready to die, and we shall die cheerfully and proudly. Personally, I do not hope or even desire to live. You must not grieve for all this. We have preserved Ireland's honor and our own. Pierce would be dead two days later. It was a strange ending for a scholar and poet who had once committed his life to peace. In the last week of his life, Pierce had led one of the most destructive revolts in Irish history, the Easter Rising. His ambitious goal? To bring England's 800-year rule over Ireland to an end. Ireland had been colonized by its neighbor England in the late 12th century. Over the years, British occupiers had stripped the Irish of their land, suppressed their Catholic religion, and silenced their native language. England had not given to the Irish an equal share in the growing riches of Great Britain. The political system in Britain was unresponsive to the mass majority of Irish people who were poor and Catholic and um, hardly educated or lightly educated with very few opportunities for any kind of social or economic advancement. With nothing left to lose, some Irish turned to rebel activity in hopes of taking back their country through force. But not Patrick Pierce, at least not at first. Pierce was a part-time writer and full-time teacher who had opened a school to teach Irish language and literature to children. But Pierce came to realize that Irish culture and traditions could never be restored while the British were still in power. Pierce said, there's one thing worse than bloodshed, and that's slavery. And he suggested that that's precisely what uh, continued uh, linkage with England meant was continued bondage to slavery. Pierce joined a radical rebel group called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or IRB. The IRB was holding meetings in a Dublin tobacco shop, secretly plotting revolution. The IRB's leader was Thomas Clark, an ex-convict with terrorist ties who'd served 15 years in a London prison for a bombing campaign. Clark had returned to Ireland bent on insurrection. If you looked at Thomas Clark, you would have thought, geez, that just didn't seem like the most imposing guy in the world. But he did have an eye for talent and figuring out who was susceptible to Republican ideas and who could serve the movement. Clark needed a leader, someone less controversial than himself, to head up a revolt against England. His unlikely choice? Patrick Pierce. Pierce was a romantic and an idealist. And it was kind of a dreamy individual until he met Tom Clark. And somehow Clark figured out that this was the guy that he needed to go out and inspire the troops. And Pierce rose to the occasion and became a national figure. We pledge to Ireland our love. And we pledge to British rule in Ireland our hate. 
I hold it a Christian thing to hate evil, to hate untruth, to hate oppression, and hating them, to strive to overthrow them. Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. Here seemed to light a fire in people. Somehow his words changed the way that they understood things, that they talked about uh, a new sense of affirmation and identity as an Irish person. Pierce vowed to free Ireland or die trying. In 1915, he and Clark began to plan for an armed uprising against the British. They would need at least 100,000 troops to seize control of Dublin's main buildings and key positions in the Irish countryside. They'd strike down British forces along their path, inspiring a nationwide revolt and finally declare independence for the people of Ireland. If only it were that easy. When Pierce and Clark surveyed their comrades, they met the wide eyes of improbable fighters. Many of the men, Pierce included, had never fired a gun in their lives. Among them, Joseph Plunkett, a fellow poet and a literary editor, he wrote poems about God, nature, and love for his fiancée, Grace. Thomas McDonough, another poet and professor who went from teaching Jane Austen to joining the rebel movement. Eamon de Valera, an American-born math teacher with political aspirations, and Pierce's little brother, Willie. It's been called the Poets' Rebellion, and it is remarkable how many of the, the leaders of the 1916 Rising were, in fact, uh, teachers and writers uh, and intellectuals. If they were going to fight, they would need help. Pierce and his men enlisted a military leader named James Connolly, who had honed his fighting skills while in service to the British Army. Connolly's second in command was a bloodthirsty aristocrat named Countess Constance Markievicz. It's a very unlikely group of revolutionaries, putting it mildly. But Thomas Clark and the young men that he's gathered around him in that tobacco shop begin to organize to lead the country or inspire the country into an insurrection. We love freedom and desire it. To us it is more desirable than anything in the world. If you strike us down now, we shall rise again and renew the fight. You cannot conquer Ireland. You cannot extinguish the Irish passion for freedom. But public support was hard to find. While many Irish liked the idea of independence, a majority was holding out hope for a nonviolent solution with England. Few supported an insurrection, and almost none supported the increasingly aggressive strategy offered by Pierce. They had good reason. Britain was the most powerful empire in the world. It had conquered land on nearly every continent and included over 400 million people. Ireland had attempted rebellion before and was bitterly defeated. But in 1916, Pierce saw an opportunity. England was embroiled in the First World War, which had begun two years earlier. I think the old adage England's difficulty, Ireland's opportunity captures the whole spirit of what energized the movement. Pierce felt that with the carnage that was taking place on the Western Front at the time, that Britain simply couldn't afford re uh, transporting troops to suppress a rebellion in Ireland. With the World War rapidly depleting England's weapons and troops, Pierce ordered his men to strike soon, while British defenses were down. Clark agreed, and they set a date. Easter Sunday. The rising would begin right in the center of town at the Dublin General Post Office. The post office is a very large building. Uh, it's a very imposing granite structure, etc. And it has a kind of symbolic significance on O'Connell Street, which is the main thoroughfare of downtown Dublin. And Pierce was very conscious of the symbolism involved. But before they could strike, the rebels needed cash and guns, fast. They turned to the United States. Millions of Irish had fled to a better life in America, 